you, Ravi, for uh, being here. Uh, uh, before uh, you know, uh, we start the conversation, let me set the context a bit. Uh, Ravi uh, uh, has been uh, now HDFC seven plus years, Ravi, uh, and uh, uh, he wears now two hats. Apart from being the, in addition to being the CM of HDFC Bank, he's also the head of direct to consumer business. Uh, uh, you know, it's uh, it's interesting. I I was reading a survey. Uh, HDFC incidentally happens to be, I'm sure many of you know, the third largest uh, company by market cap in India. And so that's a very sort of large uh, business to run. And uh, marketing, as uh, we've all we all know, contributes significantly to you know growth of business. I'm sure Ravi's boss uh, believes that as well. Uh, Twelve point, uh, you know, twelve lakh crore uh, is their market cap, and in the seven years he's been there, it's moved almost three times, Ravi. So, you know, marketing can take some credit for growth in market cap. I, I wouldn't afford to get into that area. Right. So, you know, I was reading a survey by uh, Spencer Stewart, uh, which is one of the, uh, you know, uh, globally leading executive search firms, uh, about the, you know, tenure of CMOs and uh, the survey. Uh, they, they do the survey every year across roughly 100 global companies this year. They did the survey across 500 companies. The average tenure of a CMO, uh, according to the survey, is roughly four years and a bit, right? Uh, which, uh, which in today's day and age, uh, you know, is, is, is quite a lot, but, you know, the, the tenure is decreasing. What's your view on, uh, you know, uh, CMO tenures in India, Ravi, and, uh, you know, what, what is it that kind of, you know, is, is pushing companies to change their CMOs uh, as often as it is happening these days? There are multiple perspectives uh, which one can have on this uh, specifically. And anyway, first, thanks for uh, asking us to be here. See, the first is, uh, it depends on the industry and the sector that you are in. If you look at the traditional sector, telecom, FMCG, there is a lot of opportunities available for the MNC CMOs to move around across countries. So that's one of the reasons why you will see a lot of uh, ch churn there. But if you look at Indian, most of the CMOs also get into commercial line businesses because that's how most of these traditional companies have been built up because marketing is the core of what it is all about in whether it is FMCG, telecom, durables and all. Most of them move from they're anyway distribution-led companies. Sales is not the biggest thing. No direct sales is happening. It's primarily distribution-led sales. So marketing is primarily accountable for bringing the customer in. And once the customer has to come in, you need to be in the position to understand what is it that your value proposition is, how are you creating that value proposition in line with changing times and all. And then they tend to move up in that ladder. And I think that's the reason. But if you see banks and if you see many other places, where there is a huge amount of direct-to-consumer business, meaning there is more of direct sales which is happening, where there is a human being involved in the chain, you will see marketing has taken a kind of a backseat because it's more of a sales-driven organization. And of late, technology has helped marketing to carve out its niche in these kind of sectors. So after having spent, what, some 20 years outside banking, to come into a bank like HDFC Bank, the challenge and the opportunity that we saw for ourselves is all about saying, hey, with the digital and with the technology that's available, the brand is already set. Everybody knows what HDFC Bank is all about, what products and services they provide. How can we now leverage digital, not just to create awareness, but also to create business? I think that's the reason why you'll see a lot of people moving in this direction. And the more you do it, the fact that my designation has changed shows that, yes, we have delivered. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that one. And second, I think if you look at, you know, the trajectory of marketing in the last two decades, certainly the importance of marketing managers, CMOs to also become business managers has gone up tremendously, right? You can't just have a narrow view of, you know, what's happening in your consumer reach out, uh, you know, space and not be oblivious to what's happening with the larger business, especially, you know, now, as we all call, we live in a permanent VUCA world, so to say. I, I agree. I think the definition of what are KRAs and KPIs that used to be there maybe 15 years back to what it is now as more and more data driven businesses are coming along, 
our KPIs have changed dramatically. And the KPIs are no more about share of voice, share of expenditure, what is the consumer brand equity have. I'm not saying that these are not important, these are extremely important, they're the foundations. But people are asking us, what is it that you're building on top of this foundation? So if it is not directly related to business, and digital allows you to measure the contribution directly that you're providing to the business, and that has helped us change the conversation. Yeah, I mean, as the KPIs for the CMO changes, so does KPIs for your, you know, partners, whether of it is course. agencies and digital agencies and, you know, media companies. Let me, let me take you on, you know, the second hat you, you know, we are now, which is running the D2C business. You know, banks especially, I'm not talking the larger BFSI sector, but banks specifically, you know, have always been, uh, you know, they've always been direct to consumer, right? Uh, uh, so. So how do you approach this new D2C era, so to say? You know, you have, even in other sectors, you look at FMCG, you have legacy traditional companies launching D2C businesses. Uh, one of the objectives they have, obviously, is to create as much you know, first party data as they can. But at this, I mean, when you look at banks, you already had so much first party data, right? Including, you know, how much do I earn and, you know, how much do I deposit and so on and so forth. So what is the kind of D2C uh, uh, challenge for banks to do and you know what kind of work uh, are, you, are you doing in that space? So banks are a direct to consumer business but there was a human involved because it's always like there is a branch, there is a relationship manager, there is people on the ground who are doing the entire stuff. You might have some channel like a DSA or a DST which banks have also tried some time back and there is a virtual telecalling channel which is also there. Now what banks are defining as direct to consumer business is from the brand to the consumer with no man in the middle. And that's the difference in the way in which banks are approaching this D2C that uh, I'm talking about. Here the biggest advantage is, obviously we don't have a physical product to sell except for credit cards where we need to give you a physical product. The rest of the thing is anyway digital. And if that is digital, can origination, can servicing the customer, can the life cycle management of the customer, can all the transactions the customer wants to do and can even advocacy, can we be doing it digitally? The answer is yes, very much possible and that's how the pivot has happened in terms of saying, okay, we will directly approach customers and if you look at transactions and I doesn't keep getting bored saying this, most of the banks moved from teller counters to ATMs to phone banking to internet banking, to mobile banking, and there's no difference. Maximum is somebody has moved two years ahead of you and that's it. Everybody catches up pretty quickly. But what every one of these channels did is to change the transaction mode from physical to digital. But it didn't talk about origination, it didn't talk about servicing, it didn't talk about life cycle management. It was purely transactions. I think at HDFC Bank, we were the ones who were thinking, okay, if transactions have moved digitally, can origination be moved digitally? and not assisted, completely unassisted, can servicing move digitally, everything customer should be available, should be able to do it from the channel of their choice. So whether it is WhatsApp they are using, whether it is mobile banking they are using, or whether it is the internet they are using to browse our website, can we start all the journeys from any of these places? Because they are com extremely comfortable using all these stuff. How can we leverage that and what is it that we need to do for that? And I think that's where the germination of the idea started and we have progressed extremely well in our uh, thing. Today, 95% of our transactions are digital and more than 70% of our servicing happens digitally. Origination, we had an ambition to go up to become the biggest channel and we will get there very soon with no man in the middle. Interesting you say that I think the progress, advent and progress of technology has really you know, change the entire customer experience when it comes to the banking sector. But there's a challenge also there, right? Uh, you know, use of AI, use of chatbots, use of technology uh, takes away, one, the human touch, and two, you know, like somebody in the previous panel mentioned, the dream is to do personalization scale. It sounds fantastic, but to personalize for, you know, millions, crores of customers at that kind of scale, uh, is a long learning process and you know you face many challenges and you also make many mistakes right so tell us what are the kind of mistakes that you know banks banking sector is looking to avoid especially when you try to kind of uh, do more and more digitization uh, do use uh, more and more technology see there's, there are two things <clears throat> and the n is equal to personalization in my view is a myth at the end of the day 
the n is equal to the number of products that you can sell to the customer. If you have 10 products to sell, the number of segments is only 10. Because at the end of the day, what you want to do with the customer is to sell one of those 10 products. You might have crores and crores of customers, but it's purely the number of products that you have is what is the number of cohorts that you can think of. We have almost 57 products on the retail side. So for me, n is equal to 57. But when it comes to the n, which is the consumer, each one of them are different. And as you had started off, Naval, that we are one of the advantages is we have the first party data. So on the demography basis, we can do the segmentation and personalization at n is equal to one. Finally, I might be talking to you about the same credit card, but I can talk to you as Naval, I can talk to somebody else as Michelle, and everything is easily possible for us because we have the KYC data, we have every data, we have the ability to understand you much better purely because of the fact that we know how much you earn, where you spend, what you spend on, what are the kind of preferences you have. When you have all these stuff, the pitfalls is one mistake in terms of putting something wrong together and sending it to a consumer can actually make you lose trust in the bank. So the whole thing for us is while personalization has to be done at scale and we do it almost at n is equal to one at a consumer level, how much guardrails you put in, how much you invest in technology, what are the maker checker concept that you have to make sure that your data is not visible to anybody. And uh, we are a regulated company. We are, as you said, the third largest company in the country. So we have very, very stringent rules on how much personalization happens and what is it that we see before it goes out. We use phenomenal technology, obviously, but still there is a huge human oversight which is there. It's not as if mistakes don't happen, mistakes do happen, but how quickly you can recover and what kind of mistakes happen. Every mistake is an opportunity for us to learn. Crisis should never be wasted. So what is it that you will put it back together to make sure that same mistakes cannot get repeated. And uh, Technology investments is the key to get there. And the more you invest in technology, somebody was talking about CDP, the amount of work that you need to get everything together is not easy. How do you get your data together? How do you make sure that every data that we use, we, also, we all use cloud technologies. I think in a banking world, marketing in cloud, we were the first one to implement. But we don't have a single PI data in any of the cloud. So how much you can work with the tech experts to understand what kind of a common code that you can create. So all the PI data is within ourselves, on the firewall, within our site. You can have the, all the information outside, all the transaction information, but you can never figure out who the customer is. Once you do all the segmentation, we have a simple code. That code comes in, then from that code we resolve who is the customer, what is the email ID, what is the mobile number, what is the WhatsApp ID, what is the social media ID, picks it up and we send the messages out from our side. So that way we are very, very particular about privacy and with the latest rules on privacy and the new <coughs> data privacy angle. We were a little bit ahead of time. I think GDPR helped us understand all these things far better because of the fact that we had NRI customers and we have to be compliant with GDPR way back in 2009. We have understood a lot. We have done a lot of work. We have taken expert advice on how do we compliant with GDPR and that's helping us in terms of making sure the understanding about data, sanctity, privacy is topmost within the organization. We have a data governance officer, we have a data governance council, and all of these are helping us in terms of identifying clear guardrails for us to use the data that we have within the bank. Tell us, Ravi, uh, uh, you know, sometimes personalization can also go too far, and yesterday we had, you know, this news about TRAI banning some, you know, two crore plus uh, pesky telecalling companies. and. Uh, you know, it is not about HDFC, but banking has been an ecosystem which has had been at the forefront of, you know, customer reaching out, re reach out, selling us all sorts of product. And uh, many times this can also go too far. It can, you know, be counterproductive. And uh, I, I would say all banks at some point, I'm sure all of us have received many, you know, what we call spam and junk calls from banks. Uh, how do you draw a line there because, you know, unfortunately the regulation in India, while it might exist on paper, on ground it hasn't really worked the way it should. So how do you, how does HDFC bank approach that because beyond a point things might not even be in your control. There are some agents who have sub-agents who are doing, you know, things that, you know, that don't follow, you know, your sort of written uh, 
So we have very strict contractual guidelines, but still all these things keep happening. So what we do is we have mystery shopping and uh, we ask people and whenever we get any kind of a complaint on any phone number, we do mystery shopping by calling the number back again or sending an SMS saying we are interested and then we actually put a form, a lead form. And then we figure out from which DSA code or which employee code it has come in and then we know what has happened. So we have stages, if there is an NDNC customer who has been called by any one of our DSA and there has been a complaint and a final form has come from that DSA based on the mystery shopping that we did, we straight away sack them. And that's the way in which we are handling. We do a lots and lots of mystery shopping. Because this is the only way because telecom as nature, you are supposed to be calling anybody. You can't prevent one number from reaching out any number in the world. And we are very happy with the latest regulations that are going to come in, which in my view will help spam and fraud control big time. Where we have, <clears throat> over a period of time, made sure that SMSs go only from very, very regulated HDFC BKBM or BN. All the links that we send in the SMS are all on hdfcbk.io. We don't send any other links. So we keep educating customers about saying that do not even look at any mobile number from where the SMS originated. The banks will never do that. Banks call center will never call you from a 10 digit mobile number. So you can easily identify and if you want to know anything about the bank, please do come and visit in our website and find out the correct call center numbers. But if I look at the latest TRA guidelines where you have to list the call center number, you have to list the URLs, you have to list the dynamic URLs, I'm sure a lot more is going to happen in terms of spam control and fraud control. So let me uh, take you up on spam and fraud control this year, HDFC Bank, your campaign with, uh, you know, Anu Menon won a silver at Cannes and uh, you, you've been, HDFC Bank has been all over the place informing, educating customers about not to fall prey to these, you know, spam and uh, junk calls. Being the biggest bank also has its kind of, you know, if there was a flip side, this would be one. You are the most sort of misused kind of uh, name out there. But that uh, Lola Kutti campaign did generate a lot of, uh, lot of uh, you know, uh, buzz. Uh, then you took it forward. Uh, you added Nora Fateh to, you know, that campaign. So what was the genesis of that? And tell us a little more in terms of, you know, uh, sort of how do you reap the benefits of that? See, the first thing is, uh, it, it, we see a lot of cases and the kind of money people lose falling prey to some of these things, whether it is the KYC scam or the pan update scam or the electricity bill scam, <clears throat> most of them seems to be senior citizens or even people, many people in the room, I can tell you, don't assume that you will not fall prey. I can tell you stories and stories of our customers. I've been, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm an exhibit. Oh, is it? <laughs> so there is multiple ways in which people can exploit your moment of weakness, whether it is greed, whether it is lust, whether it is multiple things, they can exploit your greed. And that's what was happening. And as usual, uh, being the biggest bank, we are also the most digitally savvy bank in terms of customer base. Even our senior citizens, when we changed, it's a small, uh, anecdote, we wanted to protect our senior citizens and we said, if you are above 70, to add a beneficiary, you have to come to the branch. The number of complaints we got is phenomenal. Every senior citizen said, what do you think? We are not digitally aware, is it? How can you not allow me in the wing? I don't want to come to the branch. So that's the kind of customers that we have. So when we see the number of frauds that are happening, when we see the kind of money people are losing, we thought it is our best response would be to go ahead and educate customers. And it's not as if like other banks are not doing, we are not doing. We have to find different ways of making sure the message is actually delivered to the customer. So if you see in 2020 when COVID stuck, we had Kambari as the rapper who came and said, Mubandrak. And that was the time because everybody was to wear a mask. We said, okay, use that to say, don't say your OTP. And as we are trying to think like, what are the newer ways to engage with customers? And the social media was really, really catching pace at that point of time and social media influencers have become big. We said why not create our own social media influencer and uh, when we are jamming with our agency this idea came, we discussed, debated, Ankit is here, part of the same agency group. So then we said why not create a influencer from our own influencer and we will see how it works. We will take it, we will take a pot shot, what's not, what's wrong and for our Surprise also, it really worked very well. And this is the second year. First year we said, we just need to make sure that she is the one who fights the fraud. 
And second day we said, okay, now that she has already gone ahead and established herself as an influencer, particularly to fight against frauds, what is it that we can do? So we said, okay, we need a more bigger army to join her. So second year become from vigilante to vigil army. And I'm very happy to say she has more than two and a half million followers in WhatsApp. Two and a half million followers in WhatsApp who are actually getting messages from vigilante every two weeks, every week when we get to know about a new scam that's happening in the market, we send it to those people. And I'm sure most of the people who are getting it will also forwarding it to their respective groups in which they are members of. And we are ha happy with what has happened. I think still a huge amount of work needs to be done. Hopefully this TRA implementation will also help us in terms of preventing much more frauds happen. But there's no other way other than being extremely vigil. If any of you believe in this room that you're not going to be defrauded, don't believe that. Please be more cautious about it. Please do follow Vigilante. You will get to know what is happening in terms of frauds because we as the biggest bank in the country are the first ones to get to know of it in terms of complaints that comes to us, saying I lost my money. How? And uh, another factor of all the complaints, not even one complaint, the ombudsman had said there is a deficiency of service in the bank, which means it is all customer gullibility. So if that is the kind of situation that we see on the ground, Please be aware, and that's the only thing I can let you know all. Please follow Vigilante. We will let you know what is the latest scam that's happening because of the complaints that we get, and you will be aware about what's happening. And how, how innovative these scams are becoming, they can put some of our creative uh, industry colleagues to shame. You know, uh, let me take you on, you know, it's interesting you mentioned Vigilante and, you know, Lola Kuti and her whole thing. You know, this financial influencers, uh, you know, ecosystem is also becoming kind of a bone of contention in some circles, especially as key has been flagging this issue repeatedly because, you know, there's money involved and in some cases, you know, serious money involved, you know, what you can sell to the customer, how you sell it, who can talk about it, what you should talk and, you know, there are so many gray areas. So what's your... Uh, you know, SEBI, of course, in uh, June this year brought out a, you know, regulatory framework uh, about, you know, what financial influencers can stay. What's your take on, you know, the guidelines and, you know, uh, the do's and don'ts for the influencers? Because you're right in the middle of that and you use many of them yourself. So when we use it, uh, Naval, the point is it's brand. So we have the guardrails in place. So they don't do anything without our approval. So I think the problem is not that kind of uh, brands using influencers. The problem is the influencers themselves becoming brands. And when the influencers themselves becoming brands and they have a lot of followers, then people follow people for what reason? Because there is something which connects me to that particular person. And they may not be the expert on everything. And then we just follow them and we trust them because of what they know about certain areas which we don't know about and their inputs have been good for us. And then suddenly when they start talking about something else, we might think that, okay, I trust this person, I'll follow this also. And that's where I think the problem has arisen. It's good that there is regulation which is ensuring that people put their money in a very, very safe place. See, risk is not something to be avoided by any one of us. But to know what risk you are taking, we should be aware of it. And that is where I think everybody is coming in. Saying, nobody is saying that you don't invest in derivatives, you don't invest in uh, equities or you don't invest in bond markets or anything. But if you are doing it, do it fully knowingly and don't do it on the basis of tips and don't base it on the basis of people who are self-proclaimed experts. Yeah. And uh, the number of telegram scams, I just, yesterday or day before yesterday, some 40 people have been rescued from Laos, Cambodia. All Indians working in Laos, Cambodia, where people have been trained to send you telegram messages on what stocks to invest and obviously there is nothing. It is all a fake website which has been created. They show you increase in your value of portfolio and then after you increase your money, suddenly the website is gone. So that's the kind of scale. As you said, they are much more creative. That's where the crackdown is happening. I don't see brands have a problem. When brands use influencers, I seriously hope it's happening, but brands have to take that responsibility. If I am using an influencer, it is in my name, it is going. If anything wrong is being done by the influencer, I want the brands to be held up, not the influencer alone. Yeah, I think that's a, a very important and fair point, which is, you know, when in influencers become brands, that's where, you know, the potential to mislead happens. Uh, let me take you on one of the earlier points you mentioned about, you know, the uh, 
KPIs for CMO in today's changed world, especially in the you know banking sector. Naturally, if the KPIs for CMOs have changed, the KPIs for partners who work with that CMOs also have changed. So, in today's you know time and age, how do you look at KPIs of you know your advertising agency partners vis-a-vis -vis what they used to be say 15 years back? See, 15 years back, it used to be like what is the improvement in consideration? Top box consideration is something which we always followed, and top two box is okay, but top box, what has happened? And uh, unaided awareness and all has forgotten long time back because if you're a brand of a size where some 9,000 uh, retail outlets, you don't bother about that. Today, we are not looking at all at that, any of that. Not that we don't monitor, not that we don't measure, we do measure, but the most important KPI is, is it increasing traffic in my digital properties? Is it increasing the ability of me to generate leads for the products that we sell? The third is, is it actually helping me in conversions? If you have to create awareness about your product, it is primarily about traffic in our digital property. Earlier we used to say what is the footfall which is increasing in branches and nobody would be able to measure it at any point of time. Today it is all about saying, if I put an advertisement within the next one hour, what is the kind of search volume that has increased? If you can't measure in that one hour having made an IPL investment and we are showing it during the cricket match, we want to track saying that at this point of time when we made the match and we had our advertisements happening, is it increasing our search query on Google? Is it making sure people come to know about the product that we are talking about, the value proposition? Are they coming to our properties? Then if it is Pesa, for example, is it increasing the download? And then over a period of time, is the organic growth happening? So digital has allowed us the ability to measure a lot. So depending on what we do, we have clear business metrics that we define. And actually, most of our uh, briefs are written like this. What is the business objective? What is the marketing objective? And what is the campaign objective? We never write only campaign objective. We actually start with the business, we go to the marketing, and then we talk about the campaign objective. And each one has a specific measure. And finally, success is defined by whether we achieve the business metrics or not. Yeah, I think very important. That's how we started the conversation about how you know agency partners, the work they are doing, how it plugs into the larger marketing objectives, which then plug into the larger business objectives. How does IPL play a role since you mentioned about IPL, it's a significant investment and you guys have been doing it for a while. And obviously the cost economics of large impact properties have to be looked at very closely. Uh, and for a bank of uh, you know your size, which does not, as you said, need any unaided recall at all, how does IPL sort of fit in because many large companies uh, they would look at it differently and say we don't need to be on a, a costly platform like IPL to create, uh, you know, to meet our business objectives. See, any media plan that we do depends on what's the objective that we have written down for ourselves. And uh, I, there's no property in India other than IPL if you want to create impact. And that's like unavoidable if you want to really create impact. At HDFC Bank, we have very, very clear saying that if I have something new, if I have something which was not expected from the bank to happen, like for example, first time when we used IPL, it was for festive treats. We said we are one now, like everybody said the shopping festivals will always be powered by Amazon and the flip cards of the world. And finally, what we were, we were actually putting a lot of money. And even now you will see the big billion day sale or the great Indian sale that happens. You have seen banks participating with 5% cash back, 10% cash back. And a lot of this is funded by the banks. But what are we getting? At the end of the day, what we were getting is one small mention there, right? Yes, obviously it had a phenomenal business benefit in terms of our cards getting used, but in terms of visibility, it was not clear. So what we decided to do is, anyway, we are a two-sided ecosystem and bank is there in the acquiring side, which is all the merchants are our partners. Anyway, we serve them. The card you swipe, you have customers. Where you swipe, the POS machine is ours. We are the market leaders on both sides. And we create lots and lots of offers for our customers on the cart side anyway. And the merchants are funding those offers also. So we have 10,000 merchants who have offers even today. At any point of time, we'll have somewhere around that kind of a number who will be providing those offers. We said, why can't we just put together this? And that's where the germination of idea of festive treat started. In 2019, we started first time. Obviously, we said we have to make an announcement. And we used media properties like print and other digital to start with. And uh, 2020 COVID hit us. And it is a second instance of our festive treat. And at that point of time, 
we had a much bigger task in terms of, because we said, this is going to be the reality now, six months lockdown, and uh, in other places it's almost like nine months lockdown, and uh, we were thinking, how do I revive the animal spirits in the country, and how do I create hope? As a big brand, what is it that we can do? And uh, luckily for us, because of COVID, IPL also moved from March, April period to the festive period, it coincided. We said, okay, we will go ahead and we will do what we need to do as the biggest brand in the country to kickstart the economy. So we said, okay, there is an opportunity for you to spend, even if you are going to be at home, locked up. Here is an opportunity. We will give you something. Here is what we have brought together. And that's how Festive Treat and IPL happened first time. This time we decided to do, because again, we have introduced a payment app, Pays app, a direct-to-consumer product for the first time in the market. And banks have not been known, and everybody here uses a GPay or a phone pay and not Pays app. Please do download Pays app and start using it. It's as good as GPay and phone pay. When we have that opportunity of launching that product, we said, okay, if you are serious about it, we also need to be seen as serious by the consumers. And if you are present in IPL, which is the biggest impact property in the country, people will do definitely give us that amount of love, respect that, hey, they are serious about it. And the fact that we were present both IPL as well on the TV as well as on the digital platforms really, really helped us in terms of from a level of indexed, huh? I'm talking about indexed. When we asked about awareness, unaided of PaysApp, if the index was one, post IPL, it has moved to 4X. And that's the kind of impact you can get when you go in for these impact properties. But I think the choice is made based on your situation. Sure, yeah. <clears throat> Absolutely. I think big impact properties, the cost consideration, you know, uh, comes into play. I, I see time's up. So last two questions, Ravi. You know, as a marketer, I'm sure you've faced this question many times about performance versus brand, right? It's a uh, perennial story, especially in the last 20 years uh, since the advent of, you know, digital advertising. Uh, and no marketer worth her salt will uh, do performance as at the expense of building a brand. But, uh, you know, we've seen so many D2C companies in the last few years who focus primarily on performance, who could not build a brand and then, you know, the business went south. But for the banking sector specifically, and I said this earlier during the day, performance marketing as a term was actually coined originally for the BFSI sector. And now everybody has taken that on, right? What are the challenges and, you know, the kind of, uh, you know, issues you see with over-focusing on performance, uh, uh, performance marketing and under-investing in, you know, building your brand? So... <clears throat> First thing is, uh, I want to dispel this notion that uh, the campaigns that we have done in the 90s, 80s, 1990s, 2000, 2010s, and 2020s, assuming that they're all on television, press, or anything, was brand marketing. They were also performance marketing. Okay, if you look at any FMCG, if you look at any telecom, the fact that we had Zuzus doesn't mean that it was only brand marketing, it was performance marketing because that's the only way these companies sold. And we started off with that conversation saying that Vodafone did not have people on the ground to sell. People walked in. How do you make people walk into your shop? How do you make people go and select Vodafone across multiple brands that exist in a retail store? The work that we all have done, that is also performance marketing. So there's no differentiation in my mind between brand marketing and performance marketing. For me, it is the same. Are you able to generate demand in the consumer? That's it. Finally, at the end of the day, both of them has to do the same job. Full funnel marketing is a must. And in my simple English, I keep saying performance marketing is for today's customer, brand marketing is for tomorrow's customer. I run a direct-to-consumer business. I have a monthly target. It doesn't mean that I don't have to sell one year down the line. I don't have to sell two months down the line. Every month we need to sell. If I'm going to come and talk to a customer only at the point of time when the customer is ready, and before that, I have never spoken to that customer. You think they are going to choose me? Answer is no. So full funnel marketing is important. Brand marketing is important so that you continue to be at the top of the mind of a consumer. If they are looking for a personal loan, they should be thinking HDFC Bank. And uh, my famous statement of my ex-CEO is, if they think of money, they should be thinking of HDFC Bank. If you don't come at that point of time, and finally, I want the loan now, I am ready. At this point of time, if you're going to trust only performance marketing, you may not be the only one reaching at that point of time. 
there will be multiple people who are money is money you don't bother about where you get the money this is actual consumer research when it comes to putting money <clears throat> they are very very particular about which bank i will place the money in because it's your money you have to trust the bank when you are taking money nobody is bothered after the money is taken it is the bank's problem to collect it from you they don't bother they will go to any bank which gives you a lower interest rate and it is true as consumers for all of us so you can't allow the consumer to think about you only when the right time of sale is going to happen so full funnel marketing is a must top funnel mid funnel bottom funnel everything has to be done if you keep yourself at the top of mind of a consumer in terms of awareness consideration then only when the intent is there they will look at you otherwise you will be spending a huge amount of money and if performance marketing is the only way to go i think most of the banks most of the d2c companies all should be looking at 100% market share right you throw money and you get it it doesn't happen that way so as consumers we will not go bite anything unless we are certain that we know about them we trust them this value proposition suits me and all these things cannot happen on the basis of the last minute digital campaigns that we do and very important message i think also to media partners that you know uh, clients are looking to acquire tomorrow's customer while also servicing today's customer well so it's not either or you need to achieve both the objectives that's your that's the hat you don one last question uh, ravi uh, bfsi uh, you know has been at the forefront of uh, you know utilization and adapting to technology also to digital advertising what is it that the bfsi sector can learn from you know other industries and other sectors you also worked in you know other sectors you worked at vodafone and before that in other sectors so what is it that the bfsi industry can learn from some of the other sectors the best thing that we always look up to other industries and sectors and whenever before we start a campaign we always ask for saying that who has done it i i strongly believe the of late all the d2c companies the way they do digital marketing is phenomenal it's all automated i i don't think anybody decides on what is the campaign to be done today or tomorrow most of them are phenomenally automated the way they have built their apps the way they have built their digital properties allows them to be very very good in terms of making sure that whatever they can do they can do it in a very fast time and the automation that i see in the way in which these people operate the campaigns they are very small teams it's not as if they are very big teams in marketing they call it business they don't call it marketing in uh, many of these d2c companies they have a clear campaign which keeps running they come in the morning they look at the results and if the results are good they don't touch anything if the results are not good they just want to see okay let me analyze and let me change whether it is the product whether it is the message whether it is the channel whether it is the place and that's it or it's a messaging that's what they do and i think that's where bfsa can learn a lot in terms of how do we automate many of the things that we do and how do we put it in an auto mode where people who have the have the capability do not actually waste their time on creating the campaigns but they are actually looking at the results of the campaigns and then trying to see which element needs modification for me to do better fantastic thank you so much ravi for a well rounded conversation